Father, thank you for the opportunity to hear your voice. We ask that your Holy Spirit may speak to us as we go into your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We continue in our series in the book of Romans. And today on the third chapter of Romans. So I recommend you read at home the first verses that we we haven't read. Otherwise, we'll have to read 31 verses. <laughs> this will take quite a long time in our service. So I recommend you to read the other verses at home. But the, the central message of this chapter we read on these verses. So last week, we spoke on the second chapter and just to make a resume on on the second chapter so the second chapter the jews are under condemnation even them criticizing the gentiles the bible also says that there is no partiality in god's judgments okay second chapter of romans is talking that there is no partiality in god's judgments god is righteous and also in the second chapter the bible speaks about three mistakes of the jews one is the phones no no sorry <laughs> the first mistakes of the jews is that they thought that they were above all judgment so the jews they thought that they were above all judgments the second mistakes of the jews that they did not understand the election. So because God chose the nation of Israel, because they were the chosen ones, so they thought, oh, we are the good ones. That we, God has chosen us because we are the perfect people. So they did not understand the election. And the third mistake was they had a hard heart and they were judging all the other nations while they were doing the same mistakes and committing the same sins. So today on the third chapter, the Apostle Paul is showing that both Jews and Gentiles are under the wrath of God. First chapter, he's talking exclusively to the Gentiles, that the Gentiles are under condemnation. They are under judgment before God. The second chapter, he talks about the nation of Israel. He talks about the Jews. And in the third chapter, he talks about both. Both of them, Jews and Gentiles, they are under condemnation, under the wrath of God because of their sins. The Apostle Paul starts the third chapter talking about the advantage of the Jews. What is the advantage of being a Jew? So the Jew would read the second chapter of Romans and argue what is the advantage of being a Jew because in the second chapter the Apostle Paul is criticizing them showing their problems showing that they <laughs> received the law and even though having the law of God they were doing all the same mistakes and committing the same sins that the other nations were committing so a Jew would read the second chapter and say okay so we are under the judgment of God we we have sinned against the Lord. We committed the same sins as the other nations. We dishonor our God. We break the law. So what is the advantage? This is the question that the Apostle Paul starts in the third chapter. What is the advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To being with the Jews were entrusted the oracles of God. So the Apostle Paul is saying to the nation of Israel, what is your advantage? The only advantage you have from the other nations is that the oracles of God, the word of God was given to the Jews. So it was through the nation of Israel that the word of God was given, the Old Testament particularly. So the five books, the first five books of the Bible is the Pentateuch, was written by Moses. 
So Moses, as a Jew, as a descendant of Abraham, so the word of God was given to the nation of Israel. So a Jew would read the second chapter, and the Apostle Paul is accusing them, saying, you, you commit the same sins as the Gentiles, and you're proud of yourself. You claim that you're a good person, but you're doing the same mistakes. And then a Jew would argue with the Apostle Paul. So what's the advantage of being a Jew? If you're saying we, we are like the Gentiles, committing the same sins, what is the advantage? The Apostle Paul says the advantage is that you received the Word of God. It was through the nation of Israel that the Word of God, that the Old Testament was given. So what this means? This means that they were privileged to receive the Word, but their responsibility <laughs> was bigger than the others. Remember, I spoke on the first chapter that God revealed Himself in nature. Look to the planets. Look everything that exists. God revealed Himself. So God revealed to the Gentiles, everyone who's not a Jew, who doesn't have the Abraham's blood. God revealed Himself in nature. Look to the skies. Everything that exists shows the glory of God, shows the mercy of the Lord. But to the nation of Israel... He revealed himself in nature, but he also gave his word to the nation of Israel. The Jews received the oracles of God. So this means that their responsibility was bigger than the other nations. But what happened to the nation of Israel? They received the revelation of God and they received the word of God. Even then, they rejected and did not believe in His Word. So God gave the Word. God gave His oracles to the people of Israel. And even then they rejected and they did not believe in the Word of God. And the question of the Apostle Paul is, is God unrighteous? Because God made a promise. God said to Abraham, through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. So God made a promise. And God made this promise knowing that the people of Israel, they were, they, they were not going to believe. They will not believe. God knew that before, before He made the promise. So why He made the promise knowing that they will not fulfill the law? <laughs> Is God unrighteous? So he promised to save Israel, but they did not believe. So God is faithful. Even the nation of Israel not believing in the word, God kept his promise. What God has promised to you, he will fulfill. What God has promised to this church, to our lives, he will do it. Because God is faithful. Even when we're not faithful, He still remains faithful. That is the character of God that cannot be changed. God is faithful. And how God proved that He's faithful in this particular promise, because He promised to the nation of Israel to save them. He gave His word. But even though the nation of Israel did not believe in Him, look to the Old Testament. How many chances God gave to those people? Hmm. And don't be quick to judge them, because how many chances the Lord has given to us? Is God unrighteous? No, God is not unrighteous. God is faithful. He kept His word. He kept His promise. God is righteous. This means that God has to punish sin. Sin has to be punished. Otherwise, God is not righteous. You ever thought about someone who committed a crime and the, the judge did not condemn him for his crime? Hmm. A terrible crime. Let's, let's think about this. I have seen this a lot in my country. I have seen this a lot there. People commit horrible crimes and when they went to the court, they were... No sentence. No condemnation. But God has to punish sin. 
this is part of the, the character of God, of him being faithful to his own word. But even though God made a promise. So we have God is faithful. God is righteous. So God promised to save the nation of Israel. And through the nation of Israel, all the nations of the world be blessed. So God is faithful. He made a promise. But God is righteous. So the nation of Israel and all the people in this world has, as the, as the scripture says, verses 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All sin. So God is righteous. He has to punish sin. And what is the punishment of sin? It's eternal condemnation. As the Bible says in the book of Revelation at the end, all those who don't have their names written in the book of life will be sent to the lake of fire. Hell will be sent to the lake of fire. And the Bible says that that is the second death. That is the punishment. Eternal punishment and suffering for whole eternity. That's the punishment for sin. So God is faithful. God is righteous. So how do we combine the faithfulness of God and the righteousness of God in this particular promise? God promised to save Israel and through the nation of Israel save the people of this world. How did God keep his promise? He kept his promise by sending his son. And Jesus came as a son of Abraham. Jesus was a Jew. And Jesus came and through him, the faithfulness of God and the righteousness of God would be manifested. So what this means, because God is righteous, he has to punish sin. So God is going to punish according to their works. So this means that when God sent his son, God was fulfilling the promise that he made through to Abraham. He was fulfilling the promise that he made to the nation of Israel. Why? Because God was accumulating all the judgment and all the condemnation of the world. He got all the condemnation. He got the condemnation that was for me, for you, for everyone here. Everyone in Middlesbrough. Everyone in this nation. Everyone in this world. Through all the ages. He got all their sins, all their condemnation. And he applied in his own son on the cross. That was God judging us. He was applying our condemnation, your condemnation, in his son on the cross. So the eternal aspect of condemnation in sin was sorted in the redemption of Christ. Christ took in his own body our sins and our condemnation. This means that he paid the price. The debt is paid. So this brings us another question. What we have received. Instead, God given us condemnation and eternal judgment and punishment and hell, instead of God giving us that, God took our sins and applied in Jesus Christ on the cross and took Jesus' righteousness and applied to us. Isn't that marvelous? Isn't that a good thing? He exchanged. Hmm. doesn't seem to be a fair exchange. But God is righteous. He, the price for his sins, Jesus Christ paid on the cross. So this means that he took our sins and gave to us 
his righteousness. So we received from God justification. What is justification? In biblical terms, justification is to be declared righteous before God according to the merits of another person. This is not justification on the world concept of justification. This is the biblical concept of justification. It's mean, it means to be declared righteous before God according to the merits of another person. In this case, the person is Jesus Christ. So we were declared righteous before God according to the merits of Jesus Christ. So you're not righteous because, oh, I can say, oh, God, oh Lord, this week I have done this, 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 and so. I have helped this charity. I, I have done this. I went to the hospital. I prayed for this person. I did this, this. No, 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 no. You're righteous before God because of what Christ has done on the cross. So in this case, the merits of Jesus Christ were applied to us. So I'm justified before God. I'm righteous before God, not because of our merits, but because of God's righteousness. What this means in simple terms, it means that you can stand before God like sin never existed before. That's why the Bible says that when we sin, we go and confess unto the Lord. And what happens? He cleans us from all unrighteousness. So we can stand before God like sin never existed before. So when God is looking to you, He's not looking to yourself. He's not seeing you. He's seeing Jesus. Because you are covered by the blood of Jesus. And the merits of Christ is your righteousness. So this means that we can have a perfect relationship with the Father. This means that we received His Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit now lives in you. Now it's the Godhead living in man. The Bible talks about three righteous people. Three righteous people. The first is Adam before sin. The second person is Jesus Christ. And the third person is you. The third person is you now that you've been born again. Now that you received Christ and believed in him. The righteousness of God was credited into your account. All the negative that was there, all the negative balance, the overdraft limit was paid. So how do we receive this marvelous gift of justification to be declared righteous? How do I receive? How can I receive Justification. Verses 26, the Bible says, It was to show His righteousness at the present time, so that we might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Oh, so that's the secret. Have faith in Jesus. Trust only in Him. Peter cannot save you. Mary cannot save you. Columbus cannot save you. St. Stephen's cannot save you. Jesus Christ can save you. Jesus Christ is the one, is the righteous, who give us His righteousness. So you only receive that by faith. And the Bible says that faith is a gift from God. This means that salvation is a work from God. It doesn't come from you. 
was not your initiative. God operates his work through you. So no human merit can compare to the sacrifice of Christ. This is why everything you do is not enough. That's why you need the righteousness of God. And the other good news is, you will not be more righteous in heaven than you are today. So you think that in heaven, you will be more righteous than today? No, that's what the scripture is saying. He has made us righteous. He took our sins and gave us his righteousness. And my final question to you is, where is the pride? Are we allowed to be proud of ourselves? Are we better than the others? So our responsibility today is bigger. Because we have the revelation of God in nature. As everyone in this world has. But we also have this. The word of God. We have a bigger responsibility to be a witness of this word. God has called us and we can share about his love. Share about this perfect exchange. Give me your sins and I give you my righteousness. That's the proposal of God. Do you receive that by faith? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the perfect act of redemption in the cross. You took our sins, not only ours, but the sins of the whole world. You paid the price and we thank you and we glorify. We glorify you because salvation is not a work from our own, but it's a work from God. Thank you that we receive that by faith. And we worship and glorify you. We thank you for this gift. In Jesus' name. Can we all say thank you, Lord? Amen.